Hi, I'm Xuanyi, and I'm here to show you how you can implement AlphaGo. And the implementation strategy, the methods that we use to implement um, AlphaGo in Go, turns out that uh, we, we ended up asking some very fundamental questions, and we'll explore some of that as well. But re what, what I really want to show is that small teams can actually make some progress to the big questions of building an AGI. Now, if, it doesn't matter if you don't know anything about neural networks because that's I'm going to explain everything from scratch. Big task. Now, in 2016, Alpha, uh, AlphaGo was built by Google and it beat Lee Sedol, the world champion in Go, and it's been two years since. AlphaGo itself has became a family of algorithms and the latest of which is called AlphaZero. I don't work for Google, and so I want you to be mindful that when I talk about AlphaGo, I mean my implementation of AlphaGo. So why implement AlphaGo in Go? Well, one of my favorite programming languages is Go. <laughs> and I really like wordplay. And when it was announced that AlphaGo is not actually written in Go, it was written in C++ and Python and TensorFlow, and it's like, it, that really bugged me. I really, really love wordplay. So much so that my colleague, JD, actually suggested that um, if it were possible for me to implement um, AlphaGo in Go on the Alpha the DEC's Alpha architecture, I would have done it. And that's true. Right? But seriously, there are some very good reasons for re-implementing AlphaGo in Go. But before that, I want to introduce to you the cast of characters, the people who helped make this happen. We're comprised of four guys who are essentially people who, who work in the machine learning fields. We're not unfamiliar with building and deploying neural networks. So why do it in Go? Well, there are many re-implementations of AlphaGo out there, the most famous of which is Leela. But they're all written in Python and TensorFlow. Now, I've got nothing against Python or TensorFlow. I actually run the Python meetup in Sydney. But I value diversity. Having a, high, having a diverse number of implementations that are mature shows the different issues that may exist. To date, I think we're the only AlphaZero implementation that's completely outside of Python and TensorFlow. So how do you implement AlphaGo in Go? To do that, we relied on Gorgonia. Gorgonia is a family of library for, for uh, deep learning in Go, and a little bit of history here. Uh, I was actually quite frustrated with TensorFlow, uh, not TensorFlow, Theano back in the day. So I wrote Gorgonia, and about six months after I did that, about six months after I did that, Google announced and released TensorFlow. Having some FOMO syndrome, I decided to release Tensor, uh, Gorgonia. Now, whoa, this is weird. Uh, how Gorgonia works is very similar to how TensorFlow and PyTorch works. Basically, you start by creating an expression graph. A bit of side notes here. I see that um, a few blank faces. So if you've used TensorFlow or Keras, do you mind ha raising your hands? And it may escape your attention that what you're actually doing is building an expression graph. An expression graph is a representation of a mathematical expression. And I put it to you right now that all neural networks are mathematical expressions. This is a typical image that you see when people talk about neural networks. Now, it's useful to use images like these to communicate what a neural network is. But it's not entirely accurate, right? This, I think, is a much more accurate representation of a single layer of a neural network. And the genius of this equation is that it combines two things, linear transformation and a non-linear transformation. Doing so allows this function to approximate any other functions as long as you have the correct values. In order for you to have the correct values, you need to learn the values. And in order to learn the values, some parts of this expression needs to be changeable. In this expression, it's W and B that is learnable. They learn from good and bad examples through backpropagation and gradient descent. We call them weights. To understand backpropagation, we must first evaluate the expression. And we call it Y hat, the predicted value. And, um, oh dear, what's happening? And then we need to calculate the difference between the actual Y and the predicted Y. We call that Z, or in America, you call it Z. <laughs> so 
So the smaller your Z is, the better your neural network is. So how do you make your Z small? Well, recall from earlier that the weights are changeable, so the solution is quite simple. You simply change your weights and your biases to make Z as small as possible. And over the last 300 years, we've learned how to do this. It's called differentiation. You simply differentiate your output with regards to your input. The difference tells you how much to change your weights. And because we're fancy, when you use it in the context of neural networks, we call it backpropagation. But reality is it's just your basic high school chain rule. Now, it's just not enough to know how much to change W and B. It's also important to update your W and Bs and your weights to reflect the changes. These are called gradient updates. And because Z is typically small and you typically start from a big number, it's a descent. So we call it gradient descent. Now, the standard gradient descent methodologies used in typical deep learning is much more complex than the one that you see here. But the point is that you get the picture. In general, Gorgonia takes care of backpropagation and takes care of gradient descent automatically. So we only really need to worry about the forwards algorithm. Now, now that we know that uh, neural networks are essentially mathematical expressions, we can represent them as code. And if you're familiar with Lisp, this is how it may look like. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because in order, to be, uh, in order to fully understand something, I believe you need to see the same thing from different points of view. And um, another way to view a neural network is that it's a function that is still being written. Every time the weights change, a new function is being generated. And your function may be something as simple as addition, or it may be a function that takes an image and tells you whether it's a hot dog or not. So the idea is then to find the weights to, to, to generate the correct function. And you may compare this with lambda calculus. A lambda in lambda calculus generates a new function. A neural network generates a new function. And functions, as you know, may be encoded as lambda terms, or they may be encoded as girdle numbers, or in this case, they're encoded simply as a bunch of matrices. And like any function, it may also be represented as trees. See, one of the things that you start finding out after you do this for some time is that trees are everywhere. There is some sort of universality to trees. And Barry J has something quite interesting on, on the universality of, of trees in his upcoming paper. I recommend reading it. I had to cut quite a number of slides from this talk um, when I talk about trees because I tend to get quite excited about it. <laughs> but come find me after the talk uh, if you want to talk about encoding programs as trees or lambda calculus or tapes or girdle numbers or matrices, which are essentially modern variants of g-strings. So, Having an expression represented as a tree allows us to understand how uh, it is to be evaluated. You, as like any AST, you start from the bottom, you fill up the leaves with values, and you work your way up. And this, in a nutshell, is how a neural network works. By the way, the expression I showed, that's called a fully connected layer. So the next bit we need to know of is convolutions. And according to my notes here, a convolution is a transformation that preserves the spatial features of the input, blah, blah, blah. It's a very big mouthful. So to make things a bit more concrete, we have a hypothetical board game with crosses and noughts, and we wish to convolve this board with a 3x3 three three matrix that looks like this. Instead of representing the board with crosses and noughts, let's represent them as a bunch of numbers, a matrix of numbers. The current player is a cross, so we'll say the, uh, that crosses are ones and minus ones are the noughts. Empties are zeros, as, you, as it is, and so we start our convolution process. The convolution starts by us overlaying the kernel on top of the matrix. Because the kernel is a three by three, it does not cover the entire board, so we need to do this in multiple steps. To calculate the results is simple. We simply multiply the values element-wise, and then we sum it up. In this case, because everything else but the center of the kernel is a 1, the sum is 1. After that, we slide to the right. And then we repeat the process. The sum is now minus 1. And we can continue doing so until uh, the entire board has been fully convolved. Here, I want you to notice two things. One is that the result is a 3 by 3 matrix. Second, is that the result is an exact copy of whatever that is in the middle of the 5x5 board. Now, 3x3 three three 
as a result, it's because of the way I use convolutions. I specifically use something called unpadded convolution. You could, of course, pad the board, make it 7x7, seven seven, and when you run the same convolution, you will get a 5x5 five five board as its result. The fact that it's, it's an exact copy is because of the kernel I use. We call it the identity kernel, the one with the one in the middle. And as its name suggests, it returns a copy of the original. There exists other kernels, of course, and that's exactly what we want to learn. Recall from earlier, a neural network is comprised of linear transformations and nonlinearity applied to it. Well, what did I say a convolution was again? A bunch of multiplications and then a summation. It is a linear operation, and hence the goal of the neural network is to learn the kernel. Finally, we need to talk about neural network architectures in order to understand how alpha zero's neural networks work. I'm going to introduce another way of representing neural networks. This way. Ooh, this way. And I've introduced a fully connected layer. I've introduced the convolution layer earlier. A deep neural network is similar, except with more layers. Having a deep neural network is cool. Everyone's doing it nowadays. The accuracy of your prediction increases as you add the number of layers. But that's cheating. As you add the number of layers, you're essentially adding the number of knobs and dials you get to control your function parameters, so to speak. But when you have more knobs and dials than, than your data points, you're going to run into weird things like high training error rates or overfitting. You don't want to do that. So a bunch of smart people from Microsoft observed that in order to fix such a problem, you simply need to make a copy of the input and add it to the output before applying the nonlinearity. This is called a residual neural network. With this, we now have the fundamentals to build AlphaGo. AlphaGo in its core is surprisingly simple. There are only two components. First, ooh, first there is a neural network that detects patterns on a board and it makes decisions on where to place the next stone. The architecture looks something like this, and I want you to notice something. The neural network returns a policy and a value. A policy is essentially a decision on what actions to take next. It's a list of probabilities, and each cell in that, that list is, uh, represents a placement to place a stone. The value is what economists would call an expected value, how much the, the policy is worth, and that is all the neural network does. Now, the second component is actually the interesting part. It's good old-fashioned AI. When the AlphaGo paper first came out, I was not warm to the idea. But the more I thought about the problem space, the more I thought that was a very, very brilliant idea. By the time AlphaZero's paper came out, I was sold. See, ooh, see, the policy indicates what the best action is. And really, the question is, is it the best action? Well, to do that, AlphaGo needs to figure out what the opponents may do. So in order to do that, let's imagine ourselves to be part of AlphaGo and we're playing a game of tic-tac-toe. The board positions are indexed as such, uh, 0 to 8, and the game is in mid-flight. So we've got a policy now that says that we've got to place a knot in position 2. Is this really the best place? What if we place it here and our opponent places it on position 6? These kinds of counterfactual questions are answered by the Monte Carlo tree search, and it looks something like this. It basically goes through as many possible scenarios as possible, and that is the genius that lies at the heart of AlphaGo, is the way it treats and approaches searches. When you have a huge search space, you need to constrain your search space, and that's what the neural network does. By releasing its policy, it constrains how wide to search, and the, the value essentially constrains how deep to search. And then after that, the neural network AlphaGo itself finalizes on a decision, and the action's taken. The game continues. And that's, in a nutshell, how AlphaGo works. So we now turn our focus to zero. It's called zero because there's no training data from humans required. The way it works is quite simple. A neural network plays a game against itself. The game's being recorded and used as a training data for a new neural network. Once that neural net the new neural network is trained, you pit the old versus the new, and if the new wins, past a certain proportion of time, we use the new network as the de facto network. 
We simply rinse and repeat, and now we've eliminated the requirements for us to exist. This is joking. <laughs> okay, so now we're ready to talk about implementation. And if you listen to detractors, there is a lot of disgruntlement about Go. No generics. If R is not nil, ha. Huh. But really, the neural network of Alpha Zero is rather straightforward. It's simple enough that I can show you the forwards algorithm in one slide. And the algorithm for the self-play bit is also quite straightforward, right? Again, it can be shown in one slide. Oh. <laughs> Look, the point here is not for you to read the code. It's available in the repository for your leisurely perusal later on. The point I'm trying to make here is that it's not that difficult to implement alpha zero. Using Go, deployment is equally simple. Just run, go run, or go build. And if you want to use CUDA and, and accel accelerate your processing, use the flag, the CUDA flag. I can build for Windows, I can build for Mac OS, and I can build for Linux all with a single flag change. That said, I've got a live version of AlphaGo running. My, my implementation anyways. Ooh, what the? Oh. Sorry, let's try to move this to mirror. All right, there you go. Uh, this is a live version. It's supposed to run inside the presentation, but unfortunately, I could not see what's happening. So <laughs> we can actually play. And here you can see the output and policies of what a neural network does. And this is a game called Comey, no relation to James. Oh, no one gets that. Okay, fine. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you play Warframe, you might be familiar with this uh, game. It's a mini game inside Warframe. It's like a, it's go with additional constraints in the sense that once a player captures three stones, um, the game ends. So this neural network that I had was trained last night. Bad idea to start training things last night, right? So uh, it's, not, it's not going to be as smart as it can be. So, and it doesn't play well with aggressive gameplay styles. So let's just quickly finish up. Ooh, what's this? Uh, I have no idea what I did there, but OK. There you go. Um, 20 versus 14.5. Um, with all the neural networks, you can see which weights are being, which positions are being placed nicely. So having said that, what's hard about making AlphaGo? Ooh. Clearly. Um, I don't know what happened. Mirror, what? Am I correct? Use a separate displays. There you go. Presentations are hard. And no matter how much you practice, it's still hard. Why is it only Google that managed to you know, do it? Well, the first bit that was hard for me was MCTS. The version of MCTS I have in the repository is something like the sixth time I've tried to write it. It's hard to test, it's hard to get right, and it's hard to make it perform. And the second hard part for me was go the game. The rules of the game is surprisingly intricate, and it really helps if you know the game. <laughs> when I started this, I did not know how to play. None of our team knew how to play Go. And the problem with not knowing how to play means that you're not able to evaluate whether it is good or not. But really, the last hard part, the real hard part, is the main reason why it takes big companies like Google to master Go. Training is hard. It is very, very hard. It uses a lot of resources, GPU and CPU and TPU. And you might say, hey, we live in the cloud era now. Put it in the cloud. Distribute your trainings. Well, that alone brings its own headache, right? Recall earlier from earlier that a neural network, again, I'm repeating this because it is a mathematical expression, and it learns using backpropagation and gradient descent. So let's get rid of noise, and let's imagine that there are multiple copies of the neural network, each sitting on a different EC2 box. The neural networks all did their back and forward propagation, and now they've got uh, gradients. Now it's time to update the, uh, the, the weights. You cannot update it per machine because they're all technically supposed to be the same machine, uh, same neural network. You need instead something like a, like a parameter server to be the master copy. But then when you start doing things like that, you have to start worrying and contending about network latency, processing speed. What happens if a child does not process in time? Well, you've got to wait. 
An alternative would be to use an asynchronous method like Hogwild. So you don't have to wait for everyone to finish, you just update your gradients as it goes along. But that makes your parameter server a lot more complicated. And even with a language that is excellent at concurrency like Go, this is quite a hassle. Google has quite a monopoly over the AI development space with TensorFlow, with Google Cloud and TPUs, and here, here I concede that they have the high ground because everything is so integrated. Of course, I'm not one to run from a fight, though I will admit at one point I did give up. You see, I had miscalculated how much it would cost to run this on AWS, and I was off by two magnitudes. <laughs> <laughs> I recall the conversation quite well. We were having burgers, and we were ready to massively deploy this thing, and Daryl and Gareth were like, you really want to spend $70,000 on this thing? And I was like, what do you mean $70,000? I calculated it and it cost seven hundred. dollars No. So we frantically recalculated it and my heart sank. There was no way we would get a nice model that would be comparable to the one that beat Lee at all. So I stopped caring about AlphaGo. I stopped caring about the Go playing part. See, since I was a kid, I've always wanted to build an artificial intelligence, what we call AGIs nowadays. The project was the first time in quite some time that I had been very excited over a project. And to give you some context prior to this project, I had just shut down my startup. It turns out nobody wants to pay money for a compiler that compiles English probabilistically into a program. And I was at a very low point in my life, and this project was something that I looked forward to working on every day. But now, staring back at me, was all the work that we had done for nothing. Now. Of course, this project was not work done for nothing. As they say, necessity is the mother of invention, and in facing these challenges, I believe we've done some very interesting things, and the novelty was enough to keep me satisfied. I'd like to share some of them with you, and I want to point out that these are not all good ideas. Most of them are hair-brained ideas, and most of them turned out to be failures. We started by saying, ah, this is a good idea. We can publish a paper about this. And after the results came back, it's eh, not, maybe not. But the seeds are in place for something weird and interesting to happen. So instead of continuing with our original plans, we started to ask uh, questions in increasing generality. The first question that we asked was, what other ways are there to improve training speed? Well, the answer was quite simple. You train with different things. So the first thing that we looked at was how we did distributed training. We took a cue from work done on synthetic gradients and rolled with it. The idea is simple. Instead of having to wait for all the gradients to come in through a server, use the individual gradients on each individual machine and adjust it with some sort of things. We chose to use an in-between server latency as the multiplier, and we had a linear regression model to predict the incoming gradients. As crazy as this sounds, this idea is actually quite rooted in the physical systems in your body. We've got something called afferents and reafferents systems, which essentially acts as the cache for your motor systems. And using noisy adjustments from network latency, well, that's like simulating a spiking neural network, which is what happens in your brain. The idea turns out to be not useful. <laughs> <laughs> the network latency distribution of AWS was uh, not ideal for our use case. But I think here is something interesting that can be kept in view and it might be quite useful in the future. So thinking about synthetic gradients allowed us to explore really different ideas that are not found in mainstream deep learning literature. Right? One of the things that we did was to play around with something called particle swarm optimizations. Uh, I worked with a guy, Delaney Gillian from Las Vegas, on PSOs and what it does is essentially, instead of using backpropagation to find the gradients and then change the values using gradient descent, the weights are changed randomly and you have a particle swarm of sorts that push the, uh, the weight changes in a particular direction. The results were interesting. It worked. But on the whole, it was slower than gradient descent. Gradient descent, I guess, is the main reason. The main reason we were using gradient descent in deep learning is because it, it works and works fast and it also uses a lot of memory. Now, I mainly attribute that to, to my testing and playing around code, but I definitely see some potentials in using PSO. This is because PSO can be massively parallelized, and it does not get stuck at local minimas. Ooh. Now, the PSO library of Gorgonia is not quite ready for prime time yet, so, but if you snoop around the GitHub organization, you might actually find it. 
Furthermore, using PSOs required us to rethink how neural networks are structured. And on the whole, that's not anything too major, but I was not ready to throw away years of knowledge. So we took a step back and asked the question, what is the goal? The goal at that point was still to play Go somewhat well. And so after some periods of frustration, I said we should just use transfer learning to bootstrap the network. You can think of transfer learning as refactoring. If a neural network is a function or a program, then transfer learning is refactoring. We often copy the bodies of functions and place them in new functions when we refactor, right? Transfer learning is something like that. Principle is simple. You've got two tasks that are marginally related to one another. So let's say the first task is an image recognition neural network that you've trained from work. <laughs> it's comprised of a convolution and other convolution layers and other layers. And the second task is the alpha zero neural network. Now the key thing is that these tasks share something in common. And the idea is that you just need to copy over the parts that you want, uh, you've already learned. And as a result, you only need to train on a small part. Here, I want to take a sidebar. Because when you build neural networks in complex systems like this, it's often a good idea to take the same thing, build the same thing, but test it on a smaller scale. We tested that our implementation works by building different games for the neural network to play. Same neural network plays, uh, tic-tac-toe plays, connect Four plays, Comey. Uh, and these smaller games with smaller search spaces allowed us to actually verify that things are working correctly. So in the spirit of transfer learning, the idea was that you first train on each small task, train on tic-tac-toe, train on connect Four, and then transfer the weights to the bigger network. But in order to properly do this, you need to actually understand what the neural network is learning, right? Tic-tac-toe is a three by three board. Go has a 19 by 19 board. Having to scale that up requires some fine understanding of what exactly is happening. At some point, we all got a bit frustrated and asked the question, what if the neural network just learned all the games at once? So there are two ways to do this. The first way is to share, share all the weights um, in a transfer learning style. And the second way requires a special encoding of the input. And this result turned out to be quite well. So the, the model, that, the demo that we saw earlier um, was built on top on a base of, of a bunch of training or based on multiple games at once. In the final layers, in, in, in last night, I was just giving it some final pushes to focus specifically on Comey. Yeah? Now, the work on multitask learning showed some promise. So it was us then, then very useful for us to step back and ask, what is AlphaGo good for? Why did Google spend at least $35 million on it? Well, it turns out AlphaGo is quite related to Google's core business, search. And recall that I said that the neural network essentially constrains the search, right? And that's the same reason why AlphaZero is being used to search for cancer drugs and other kinds of drugs. You know what else has a large and infinitely large search space? Optimum neural network weights. So you can guess what we tried to do next. We fed our version of AlphaGo into AlphaGo. It took quite a bit of thinking about how to model the policies and values, and the network architecture had to be changed quite a bit. But after about 200 bucks of spending on AWS, we were ready to call it quits. Nonetheless, I still think it's important that we did that, you see? I think it opened up the big questions. If anyone's familiar with Turing's paper on the halting problem, feeding AlphaGo into itself might seem somewhat familiar. So that led to the question, are we almost there to implementing an AGI? Now, I've briefly mentioned AGIs before, but I've neglected to give a definition. This is because the term AGI is very nebulous. Different people have different understandings of what it is. For me, I believe that an AGI needs to have these three things. It needs to be able to understand cause and effect. It needs to be able to compute, and it needs to be able to handle a wide variety of problems. Now, humans are causal reasoners. For the most part, we understand innately within us cause and effect. I hit my head uh, in the museum on Wednesday, and I immediately understood that the pain came from me hitting my head, not from someone kicking me. Right? So per Udaya poll, a causal reasoner can do these three things. They can see patterns, 
They can interfere and take actions, and most importantly, they can imagine alternative scenarios. Can AlphaGo do the same? Here's how AlphaGo works again. It clearly sees patterns. But can AlphaGo imagine alternative scenarios? Well, I'm being Obi-Wan here and say from a certain perspective, yes, it can. Albeit in a very, very limited sense, right? Within the allowed action space, so to speak. Lastly, AlphaGo can definitely take actions, but not interfere. So, contra Eudea poll, I think AlphaGo is somewhat of a causal reasoner. Humans can think about thinking. That's unique. According to Chomsky, that's the only thing that sets us apart from other animals. And computation is all about recursion. Can AlphaGo compute? I had mentioned earlier that we fed our version of AlphaGo into AlphaGo, but there was another fluke that led to this thought that AlphaGo might be recursive. So very early on, we trained a neural network on tic-tac-toe. And as you may know, the best move to make in tic-tac-toe is to not play at all. So it turns out the neural network and the MCTS all agreed that the best move is to make a pass. And because the opponent was running the same network, it went something like this. Pass, 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 pass. And it never ended. This took about two hours worth of training time, which is about the same amount of time that Matthew Broderick took to find out about mutually assured destruction. Now, I want to be clear. The only reason why training on tic-tac-toe yielded an infinite loop was due to the confluence of two things. One, uh, the way we designed our neural networks was that we had pass as a valid action space. And two, it was the way we assigned values to wins, losses, and draws. But this makes it clear, an AlphaGo-like system is actually capable of running into the halting problem. It's not a proof of recursivity, but it goes to reason that AlphaGo-like systems can compute. The latest NALU paper is a particularly interesting exploration on the topic. I would encourage everyone to read that. Now, lastly, humans are able to tackle a vast array of causal computation problems. We don't have a neural network in our brain that plays chess specifically. That's nuts. We can play chess. We can play tic-tac-toe. We can write Go and play Go. Earlier, I mentioned that our re-implementation was trained on a mix of games, so I'm going to say it is possible to architect a neural network that is able to tackle multiple things at once. I think it's early days, though, and the thing that I'm quite interested in playing with is having an, an attention network in the middle so that we don't have to encode um, the inputs specifically to the game. So I'm going to mark that as a yes. Now, in this talk, I've gone through the basics of the neural network, and then I've introduced um, the architecture for AlphaZero. And this is the repository. Due to a number of issues, I've not actually created this, but it will be created by the end of this weekend. <laughs> now, I had also recounted various experiments that we tried in order to overcome some resource constraints. And all of the experiments that I described may just appear to be some sort of unfocused exploration but throughout this talk, I hope I've made clear that there are two consistent themes. The first is of resource constraints. Ooh. The search for the best play is constrained by the neural network. Right? But in real life, resource constraints that happen are of money. I'm not Jeff Hinton. I'm not Demi Sasabis. And I doubt anyone would just give me money to run my own AI lab. That said, if any of you want to give me money, I, I, I won't say no to that. See, I had to get creative. I had to try very much different things, which brings me to the second theme of this talk, diversity. I truly believe that neural networks, both in our brains and on silicon, are better off if they're exposed to a greater multitude of things. And by, by an analogy, a diversity of implementations in a diverse set of languages only adds to our collective strength of understanding what neural networks are. For the record, I don't consider that uh, bind various bindings to, to, to TensorFlow in various languages to really be adding to the you know, diversity of implementations. No, I'm talking about things like Gorgonia in Go, DL4J in Java, Grenade in Haskell, or Connect in Julia. They're much more interesting. I strongly believe that more love, more support should be given to these libraries. Having said that, I am biased. I am, after all, the creator of Gorgonia. So take that with a pinch of salt. 
But I will say this, the questions that we asked and, and came up with all these weird philosophical questions, we would never have asked if we simply did the boring thing and implemented it in TensorFlow. Now, I strongly believe that there is a deep connection between the universality of trees, programs, and neural networks. Recently, there was a paper by Spivak that said that backpropagations can be viewed as functors, and if you read the paper carefully, backpropagation can be seen as lenses. So that's a good clue there, that there's some sort of deep connections. And there is so much more to explore. I believe that small teams do better in this case. I show that you don't need much resources to experiment on the weirder ideas that expose immediately the fundamental questions. Although granted, at this point in time, only the large players like Google are actually able to experiment at scale. I'm personally quite split on that. On the one hand, you get really, really cool stuff like AlphaGo. On the other hand, resource centralization means monopolization of tech and knowledge. And I, I don't, I, you know, it's, I'm not comfortable with that. So I really, really believe that it's time to build an AGI, and it should not be in the hands of corporations. What we need is a diaspora of different implementations of the weirder parts, weirder ideas, and we should make it known. I've shown that four people who mainly worked over the weekends can do quite a lot, and I'm excited for what's to come next. Go forth and diversify. Ooh, thank you.